For 5,000 years, Black Wolf studied black arts, increasing his wisdom 10,000 fold. He built a small following of frog-like creatures, but needed more troops for his evil plans. He then formed an army whose generals were called up from the black shadows of hell. Souls who waited for untold eternities for a new leader. Black Wolf's tremendous power enslaved them all to carry out his will. Then stories of Black Wolf's armies attacking neighboring countries came back. Demons of hell armed with black magic. But they would get bored or sidetracked in the middle of battle and give up running home. Fritz! Fritz, get up, for God's sake, get up! They've killed Fritz! They've killed Fritz! Those lousy, stinking yellow fairies! Those horrible, atrocity filled vermin! Those despicable animal war markers! They've killed Fritz! Take that! Take that! Take that, you Black Iron Shark Mullet! Max, Max, I'm okay. I'm okay, Max. Just a scratch. Look, I'm all right. Max. Oh. Oh, damn. There you go again, stepping on my lines, raining on my parade, costing me medals. Oh, damn. Ooh. Ooh, Fritz. Fritz, get up, for God's sake. Get up. They've killed Fritz. They've killed Fritz. Those lousy, stinking yellow fairies! Those horrible atrocity filled vermin! This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the 250th episode of Invasion of the Remake, where we're going to be talking this week about post-apocalyptic Nazi wizards, name of your prog rock band. We're going to be talking about (laughs) Ralph Bakshi's wizards for the second time, because the first time somebody's got it over in the universe but I don't. So we're doing this again because I guess an anniversary episode is so good that you got to do it more than once. <laughs> it's ironic that uh, for an episode that's Elves about magic versus projector. technology. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. It, it, I don't think this has happened in, in the Sammy era. So it's been a very long time since we actually lost an episode. But Well, um, technically it's the second time, but somehow we were able to recover. Oh, we've had because yeah, something there's similar happened. Little, there was one that where I lost little bits of one because uh, the file got corrupted, but I was able yeah. to make it work. Ironic in an episode about magic versus technology that uh, somehow we are confounded <laughs> by both. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only I could have mastery of one of them. I really want it to be magic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a magic personality. Yes. No. No, you don't. <laughs> I don't know. There's hey, something I you must because you're still friends with me. <laughs> uh, I'm just too lazy to get new friends. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> All right. Everybody's here. Uh, Sam Stepanenko. Yeah, you heard me already. Yeah, because he's, he's still like you're questioning our friendship now. Uh, Trish Cockman. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> and Jeff Omega. I am ready, and I feel like these are all people who I all knew, and one day I was just friends with everyone, and not really sure how that happened. (laughs) That's how friendships form. They just happen. (laughs) You know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, and all of a sudden you know that guy. Yeah. Yeah. 
And here we all are talking about movies. And we're going to be doing one of our favorite things is remaking an animated film into live action. And not a typical one either because uh, st- uh, we're all big fans of Ralph Bakshi. We've talked about him prior we remade uh, in episode 152, Fire and Ice. Please go check that episode out. We even had a guest on that one. Yes, I do want to mention, I forgot to mention it on our first attempt at this, is I do want to say that this one is older, but I think it looks better. The Fire and Ice, I I found the animation a little bit blurry and muddy compared to this. And I found that sort of an odd... Well, like that comes to stylistic choices. I mean, Fire and Ice deliberately has this muddy look because it's meant to look like a Frank Frazetta painting. It's based on his characters Mm, and and has those looks. Whereas this one is more based on the style of Von Bode, um, at least in the animation. And we're going to get talking about clashing styles here uh, within Mm -hmm. this one. But uh, Von Bode usually was brighter colors, a lot more cartoony in his stylings. So um, basing those characters on it, yeah, it's going to look different. It's going to feel different. And that's that's the great thing about Bakshi is no two films really feel alike unless you count the two Fritz the Cat movies. And you can't because he didn't do the second Fritz the Cat. Oh. I was just going to say, I didn't think he did the second one either. Uh, Thanks, Sam, for speaking up. uh, You know, I wasn't sure about that, but uh, visually they look similar. So um, that's interesting that he didn't do it. But it must have been like people he worked with in the first one. Um, Possibly. I just know that what happened was he he fell out with Crumb over the original one. And Crumb said, no, you can't use Frick anymore. But the studio went, well, yes, we can because we have an agreement written. But Bakshi honored Crumb's wishes and and didn't do it. Right. Yeah. Uh, at his heart, he's just a huge underground comics nerd. Mm-hmm. Underground uh, comics nerd, fantasy nerd. You know, he did the Lord of the Rings animated film yeah. long before Peter Jackson mm-hmm. did. And you can certainly see Bakshi's influence on Jackson in that movie as well. Uh-huh. So, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think we'll be talking about Bakshi again down the road yeah. about something. There are certain ones we probably will never hit, like coonskin <laughs> for yeah. for very obvious reasons but racial commentary aside there's usually a reason for it so mm-hmm. sometimes you gotta set it aside going oh okay i see why all these characters look like they're in blackface because these other characters are so much worse than what this is He's always got a very interesting way to make a commentary. And he's got it in Wizards. This was like his first one where he was attempting to do a PG one where more of the family could come and see it. But it's still just as subversive as anything else he has done. And that includes Mighty Mouse where he slipped in poppies that Mighty Mouse crushed and sniffed in an episode. (laughs) Yeah, that actually happened. (laughs) Yeah. Look it up. I'm sure somebody's uploaded it to YouTube. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure it is. Yes, in the new Adventures of Mighty Mouse from the 80s, I think it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. There's some adult humor in in some cartoons. Like, I still remember the Animaniacs one where uh, somebody's like, did you finger Prince? And the other character goes, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. She's like <laughs> holding prints and she's like, ew. Yeah. <laughs> Finger prints? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, and even even in some some Disney movies, there's a history of sneaking stuff in, like uh, in the Rescuers, where there's a centerfold from uh, an adult magazine that appears for a couple seconds in the theatrical, and I think the first VHS release of the Rescuers. Oh, nice. Well, yeah. not really, but hey, priest direction in Little Mermaid. Well, I, I remember because Sam and I worked for the same video store chain. Yeah, that was, used to be a thing, guys. And uh, there was, was it Aladdin? We had to yank the boxes off because of the, the penis tower? No, no, it was Little Mermaid. <laughs> Little, it was Little, Little Mermaid. Mermaid? Oh, it was the penis yeah. tower. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the yeah. penis tower, apparently just complete accident. But like if you look at the priest in the wedding scene at the very end, somebody said, oh, no, that's his knee. But it is an erection. <laughs> <laughs> There's a long history of, uh, yeah, animators. Well, I mean, when you really think about it, when you're an animator and you're sitting down and you're drawing small variations of the same drawings, you know, day in, day out, you got to do a little something to keep yourself entertained. Speaking of, uh, of wizards, are we keeping the penis castle? <laughs> Just to bring it back to where we are. Well, I guess there's no reason we can't leave some of the <laughs> subversiveness in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is I a weird a little thing that's, 
going to be hard to remake as a live action to begin with. So, but yeah. keeping some of the weird in there might actually work in its benefit to make it something unique. Well, I was thinking, I mean, we haven't really talked about the movie so much, but I, I would love to sort of have some of those rotoscope cut, cut scenes in the live action. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it, like, cause there's that one that's iconic. The guy blowing the horn is kind of, it's one of those images that you see quite frequently or more, at least I do somehow. And I, I just, cause every time I saw it on the screen, I'm like, Oh man, that image is just so vivid. Yeah. No, it's, it's black and white for the most part, but yeah, it just works really well. Yeah. It'd be really cool to keep them that in. And the rotoscoping was done to keep the budget down because the budget of this was, was really small. It was like 1.2 million. And they would dive into the studio libraries for the battle scenes and some of these other scenes and uh, rotoscope over top of them. Now, it would have been very cost prohibitive to have all of the individual frames blown up and then rotoscoped over. It would have ballooned this. Just that cost probably would have been well over $3 million to do. So what he wound up doing is going to an industrial photocopier that they had and just blowing up the frames and uh-huh. and then animating over top of that and it kept it down and that's why it's all very kind of shaded and in silhouette all of those scenes but yeah. that's how he rotoscoped over top of them and uh, these were all from the studio libraries yeah but it just looks fucking cool it does look cool especially one of my favorite rotoscope shots is when you know it's like obviously the old war footage and they're wearing like the nazi helmets and stuff but they just have red eyes and they have horns drawn on them <laughs> yeah it's, it's really pretty fun imagery it well, it's it's very it conveys the message really nicely and it, it again it just looks really it's visually um appealing even though it's the, a, a very dark theme i mean when you start from the beginning like it's the dark thing of like the good and the evil and the science and the magic and it's like these two brothers that are born one's like super evil and one's super good apparently <laughs> i question whether or not he's super good because he's kind of a lech oh, he's and he's lazy as fuck yeah, he's supposed to be good, though. That's the weird thing. Well, you know, it's... you think about it, Avatar's had it easy. He's, him and his brother have been at odds for so long, but Black Wolf's army is so uneducated, unfocused, the, you know, ooh, shiny, and they're off doing something else. And that was part of the problem. Mm-hmm. Black Wolf had overwhelming forces, but he, he had no leadership other than himself. And he could not keep them focused. And... That's why he sends out his troops to find all of these pre-Holocaust artifacts and uses the past as inspiration to lead his forces. But up until that point, for thousands of years, Black Wolf's forces were easily dissuaded and, and they just got lazy and complacent, the good guys, about any time these guys attacked. It's like, ah, we can easily slap them aside and not a problem. And so Avatar clearly just stopped trying. Mm-hmm. Well, and it seems like in, like in the movie, the community fractured because you have different groups of uh, different types of fairies throughout the movie, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that's part of what, what happens is, over time as well is, is you get complacent and then you sort of end up sort of splitting off. It's like, well, we don't need to be together anymore because the threat's gone or we don't need yeah. to worry about that threat. To another point, too, I mean, Avatar is uh, thousands of years old and there's only so far as having things kind of... Maybe not necessarily easier because he was raised with his mom dying. He's at her sick bed and stuff. But I think it's just like after a few thousand years, he's just become kind of affable. Kind of like, you know, he's been around such a long time that there's a lot of things that have become inconsequential to him because relatively they'll have not very much impact on the ripple of things as he sees it. And he's bored. Mm hmm. Yeah. And yeah. He, and he's really un- uninterested even in the conflict. So. When Black Wolf sends his assassin out, which was Necron 99, which they Mm -hmm. later rename Peace as they reprogram him. And he learns of this. The president's been assassinated. And they're like, okay, Avatar, we need you to lead us and and into battle. And he's like, eh, wake me when your lands are destroyed. (laughs) It's like it's not that important to him anymore. Which raises that question is, is is he as good as as he's touted to be and that and that, i think that's a good morality question to include in our remake mm-hmm. yeah and i totally agree whereas uh black wolf i mean he kind of does it out of like hating his position like him and his people the the remnants of humanity after the apocalypse 
are living in irradiated zones. They've been mutated and they're rotting. And I mean, especially Black Wolf, I mean, his skin's kind of hanging off in places. His his, uh, bones are exposed and he's really held together by his magic alone. And And hate. And hate. And he's trying to have a human son that isn't mutated with some fairy that seems to be fairly inconsequential, but he's trying to breed himself a, a son, a human son, so he can have something better for him by taking over the, the, the good lands, the one, the lands that are clean and, and that avatar controls. And they actually show a world map of where these city states are and uh, the good lands of avatar and I don't recall what those are, what the name of that land was anymore, but that was in Germany, and I do believe the irradiated zones were in Lebanon. Yeah, I think it was something like that. It was like more Middle Eastern where the irradiated zones. Yeah, which I guess zones. means the apocalypse happened in the Middle East or started there, or the big bomb well, dropped there. It was, what did they say? It was, it was five, five terrorists. terrorists that blew nukes, and then everything was destroyed. And then after, thou- was it thousands it was like of, years, of or, years? You know, millions of years. Then that's when the fairies, like the original creatures of the earth, finally came back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but was it, whatever was left before was already mutated. So Well, that makes sense because when this movie came out, that would have been sort of right around like when the whole Middle Eastern crisis was happening. What One of them was happening with Israel and, and Palestine, right? So, mm-hmm. so that I can see sort of why... It made sense to sort of have it happen there. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been certainly political commentary of the time. Let's run the trailer for Wizards 1977 by Ralph Bakshi, and we will be right back to talk more about Wizards. There will come a time on the planet Earth when science and technology will be long forgotten, when humanity will rise from the ashes of nuclear holocaust, when wizards will rule the world. 20th Century Fox presents Wizards, a futuristic fantasy epic born in the mind of Ralph Bakshi, the master of animated magic. It is the story of two brothers, Avatar and Black Wolf, powerful wizards and mortal enemies from the day they were born. Avatar, the good, who rules the peaceful kingdom of Montagar with wisdom. Science and technology were outlawed millions of years ago. And magic. Black Wolf, the future Fuhrer. Attention! Behold! Who rediscovers the ancient secrets of propaganda. Technology. And war. and sends out his muted armies in a reign of unimaginable terror. In Wizards, you will also meet the lovely Princess Eleanor, <laughs> the loyal elf, Weehawk, and Peace, Black Wolf's evil robot henchman, who is transformed into an avenging instrument of justice. Wizards is a Tolkien world of fairies and elves, sorcerers and demons it is shot 10 million years from now against strange and huge panoramic settings and it is more fantastic more enchanting and more powerful than anything you've seen before wizards the ultimate futuristic fantasy epic all right, that was the trailer for Wizards from 1977, written and directed by Ralph Bakshi, who also played a character named Fritz in this movie. So you often do hear his voice in his animation, and I kind of like his voice. You killed Fritz! You killed Fritz! He was actually most of those soldiers in that, that uh, scene. That was pretty good. And uh, like I said before, we talked about Ralph in our Fire and Ice episode 172. There's narration scenes that have stills that kind of recount the history of the world in this realm that we are watching and most of that art was done by comics great mike plug in kind of a black and white 
in gray tone style, but there would be splashes of color when they needed to illustrate something in the story and draw your eye to it. Now, I always question why those scenes were all Mike Plug, which had these great detail and, and, and an interesting style, and then you go to Von Bode for the more animation style. So, But they have like this really designy, cross-hatchy stuff for the backgrounds as well. Stylistically, there's a lot of influences going on in this film which makes it always very visually interesting to watch. And it's also got an iconic poster that probably many people will remember, despite having never seen this by William Stout, with Necron 99 sitting on his, what we'll call the Lizard Tauntaun, because it did inspire the Tauntauns that would later be in Empire Strikes Back. Just to add on to what you were saying, do you think that with the Mike Plug art style versus the style for the rest of the movie, that his more detailed kind of style for the interjections was meant to evoke reading a book about a history and then yeah i, I you cut to the animation uh, yeah it, it was I would, actually happening yeah it does it definitely has a storybook feel to it at least visually speaking i think that's probably fairly accurate beautiful art i would buy a book of all of that art and i was re- realizing while i was watching it again <laughs> Yeah. yeah, actually, I probably would too if they did that. And to be fair, what I the, the contrasting styles of animation, I really loved. Like it drew my eye to where it was supposed to go. Mm-hmm. Like it really achieved where it wanted you to look and what it wanted you to see. The uh, cast for Wizards, it's the, the voice cast for Wizards, uh, stars Bob Holt as Avatar, who we may have mentioned in uh, episode 151 because he was a voice or somebody in Bed Knobs and Broomstick. I'll be honest, I do not remember. Jesse Wells was Eleanor, probably best known for her role on Soap. Richard Romanus was Weehawk. We've talked about him a lot, apparently. I don't remember bringing up the name, but he's been in a lot of things we've covered, uh, starting with episode 26. I missed that one. Uh, that that been... Oscar. That's right. I and, remember now. Yeah. Well, maybe not a lot of stuff, but yeah. And episode 30, which would have been your first episode. Uh, well, first your ep- first official episode as a regular mm-hmm. cast. Yes. And that was Point of No Return. He was in. Um, also, Will of M. Nikita was the other film we covered there. That's right. Yeah. And... He was also played Harry in uh, the heavy metal animated anthology as well, which I just wanted to bring up because that's one of my favorite movies of all time. David Provell was Peace slash uh, Necron 99, but as Necron 99, he didn't speak, but as Peace, he did. And he was in episode 208 when we covered... The Monster Squad. The Monster (laughs) Squad. I'm surprised he even got a credit because I think he only said like three lines the whole movie, but... Yeah, he still said him. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. Jim Connell was the president, and he was a regular on Love American Style. Steve Gravers was Black Wolf, and <laughs> I I don't know if this is a porn or not. Uh, he was in a movie called Hellbent for Leather. <laughs> it was probably a Western, but I I, yeah. I like to think it sounds like a porn. It sounds like a porn. It really does it sound does. like a porn. Christopher Tabak was Peewittle. Mark Hamill, we've talked about him a few times. He played a character named Sean, which is a very minor character in this movie. But uh, we've talked about him throughout our Star Wars episodes, which were episodes 23, 123, and 223. So they're easy to find because they're 100 episodes apart. And again, most recently in episode 211, when we covered... Child's Play. He was Mm -hmm. a really great choice for that. Yeah. Remake of Chucky with Chucky's voice. Yeah, we were pleasantly surprised. That was a remake we quite enjoyed. Susan Tyrell was the narrator. She also uh, was in episode 172 of Fire and Ice. And uh, she appears in the film uh, Flesh and Blood, which we covered and remade in episode 202. And then uh, mm-hmm. I just wanted to mention Susan Anton briefly is the singing voice of Princess Eleanor former Baywatch babe, Susan Anton. There's a lot going on here. It's so funny with some of these guys, like uh, Richard Romanus, uh, when you see his face, he was uh, very much prolific in the 80s. He was that guy you saw on that thing that one time. Also has a t-shirt on uh, T Public. That's right. (laughs) Go get the t-shirt. Susan Terrell has like an amazing back catalog. I fell down a deep hole with her. There's a whole bunch that she did that was just wild and crazy. And I hope we remake some of those. Yeah, maybe one day we will. Somebody I've always pleasantly surprised about when I see her. I quite liked her in Flesh and Blood as well. 
Exactly. And I think, is this Mark Hamill's first credit? Uh, it is. Yeah, because he would have been... Yeah. He would have been doing uh, Star Wars at the time, and he was lent out because George was liking what uh, what Ralph was doing on this. So he managed to give some time off for Mark Hamill to do this. And I would imagine this was probably his first voice work yep. for animation. Nice. And yep. as we know, he would go on to do a lot of that. And I believe this movie came out three or four months before Star Wars. It came out, well, Star Wars was May. So I think it came out in February, Wizards. Yeah, it's too bad it didn't come out after them. They could have used his name to help sell it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. But nobody knew what Star Wars was going to go on to do. Yeah. It's weird. Like, they sort of did and they sort of didn't. Like, Carrie Fisher kind of flip-flopped between whether they knew it was going to be a big success and they didn't know it was going to be a big success. <laughs> That's true. If you would have saw that on as a script and nobody had done something like that before, yeah, I can see where... A lot of people would be, are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. World building was something you did in novels. It was not something you did in movies. Yeah. yeah everything is just so gonzo. Okay, well, let's get back to wizards here and this world that, yeah, Black Wolf is inspiring his troops with recovered technology from a pre- Holocaust Society, using the film reels of uh, Adolf Hitler inspiring his troops, using the master race thing to inspire his troops, despite it's a very mixed Mm -hmm. race army, but you got lizards and orcs and drunk fairies and... (laughs) And guys in suits, sure, which I guess are the of, humans. Yeah. And I guess that's kind of in line with what happened in Nazi Germany as well, anyhow, because, I mean, yeah. Hitler did tout the master race. Mm-hmm. Um, he certainly was not the epitome of it. Uh, and he was still inspiring these people who didn't meet that ideal either. Right? So there is a juxtaposition there where, where it, it is kind of similar. It's like, yeah, I'm going to motivate you to build something that you don't meet. Yeah, this is basically what a cult leader getting out of control is, you know, selling an idea. And that's what he's using to keep his military forces really focused. It is kind of odd that to stop their forces, they just have to destroy this magical film projector. I guess he's combining his magic. So it's projecting out his troops, even out on the front lines. Well, he's using it as a weapon as well. Yeah. As, as, a, as a terror tactic to scare the fairies. Cause they never see sure. anything like it. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Of course mm-hmm. not. Yeah. No. Nobody in that lens would have seen like seeing this crazy guy with a mustache and all this violence being thrown out into the ether. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's propaganda and it's also a scare tactic and it would be probably very terrifying. Well, yeah. Especially if you've never seen a plane that's dropping bombs and the, and hearing the, the cacophony of explosions, which is which would have to be deafening. And Black Wolf with what he has recovered is able to recreate the industrial machine to create more tanks and guns and things in a world that doesn't have them anymore. It's swords and sorcery and sandals for the most part shields. It's very low tech. So suddenly having this technology being introduced to his troops and into the front lines, it's unbalancing the battle as well. There's something I, I noticed as well is there's also some reference to World War One because World War Two didn't really use trenches, but that first battle scene, the all the fairies are set up in trenches expecting like a first mm-hmm. World War type of war, much like the Allies would have in World War Two, is they would have been unprepared for this new type of warfare. And yeah, I, absolutely. I, found that really interesting to sort of see the, the attention to detail that actually is there in what is, as I, I think we've, we've already said, is a fairly simple story. And mm-hmm. what I took from it too is uh, there's like one side that's very much magic and like science had destroyed the previous world. So we're going to reject that. And then it's the other side. They don't reject the the new technology because they're like, oh, that'll help us win. But they're like, we're special and we're like that was also selling of the idea. You're special. You're chosen. That's why we have this technology. That's why we're going to win this war, which is kind of what Black Wolf is sort of trying to sell to them. Well, and Avatar actually outright says that that, that they won't be using technology. That technology is bad and 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 shouldn't be used by fairies. Yeah. Yeah. He do, he knows how to reprogram Necron ninety nine. Yes. So it's sort of he's a bit hypocritical here and there. 
their definition of robot is very different than what we consider as a robot. Mm-hmm. This is not a technical being. This is basically a suit given sentience because that's really there's nothing inside other than this magical force that drives it forward, this magical programming. So it's not a robot in the typical sense. No, it's more like a golem. Yeah, I, I would definitely call it more of a golem. And what Avatar winds up doing is it, it's still reprogramming in a way, but in a magical way. And uh, that's kind of a fascinating way of dealing with this character because, you know, he's he's kind of Boba Fett, this assassin who's sent out with others of his kind to destabilize the region by taking out the political figures and the, and the leaders of the good lands. And once he's killed the president, they manage to deactivate him, essentially kill Necron 99 and reprogram this suit to lead him back to Black Wolf's lands. Well, they established that he's think- somehow connected to the projector. And I'm not sure exactly how that connection worked, but that was sort of the device that they were using is that he's connected to it and he, and he can lead him back to it through that connection. Oh, what if each one of these, like in our version, what if each one of these Necron 99, 98, 97, let's say there's 99 of them or even 100. Because there's five in this one. There's that five? That are then why, why is he 99? He's working his way backwards. He must be. Um, or maybe it's the suit. Oh, you know what? Well, he's failed that many times making ones that work. Oh, okay. True. Yeah, yeah. That could be. But what if these suits were, rather than this weird cartoony thing with the antenna on its head, what if these were developed with, like, SS outfits? Mm-hmm. And it's, like, the spirit of some of these leaders from the Nazi party that he's using to drive into these these assassin bot golem things. And he still, can, we can make him look a little weird and stuff, but um, that I guess that's why, why stormtroopers kind of look the way they look too. They were all meant to look mm-hmm. very military and uh, Nazi-like. So we could do something similar here with that, with, I don't know, gas mask and t- tubes and stuff or whatever and glowing eyes. But what if, what if that's come because they are directly driven by the ambitions of the Nazi party, and that's what these things are? I kind of like that. Uh, yeah, and that could sort of sort of explain the connection to the to the projector and and Black Wolf is is that connection to the cause, as it mm-hmm. were. I kind of want to have Hitler's brain in a jar. That's so classic. <laughs> it's <laughs> they I saved Hitler's drama. brain. <laughs> Well, free trauma wasn't the first to do that. <laughs> Fair enough. But then we'll have to no. stick his um, head in a gorilla. I, I don't know. My head goes in weird places. But yeah, I, his brain would have to be in a gorilla, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would. I think you'd have to be that Toby Jones from Winter Soldier. <laughs> or maybe Black Wolf wears it as a hat. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, that I would go for. It's like this big sort of, oh, it's this big like- giant kind of bulbous head. That sounds like Bakshi Oof. weird, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like oh. it's a crown, but like with a big, big hole sort of thing container on the top. That's connected directly into Black Wolf's <laughs> brain. With the swastikas yeah. going around it like it is actually a crown. Yeah. You know what? That is creepy, icky, and fucking wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so good. It is gross as fuck. I like it. And with Black Wolf sort of deteriorating and falling apart, like having his bones exposed, like a bit of his exposed brain at the top would totally fit that that aesthetic. Yeah, I love the idea that he's tapping into Hitler's brain directly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we don't have to use the projector per se, because it it is a weird device to be using as a live action thing. Uh, I was going to say, it worked really well in animation. simple, yeah. though. Yeah, it is simple. It's like sure. he's basically just using his magic to, instead of on a screen, make the projector project into the sky, essentially. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. like in a world where they're all very simple people. Like, they've never seen a movie before. And the very first movie they're seeing is Nazi propaganda, which is, like, ridiculous. And I like the idea of having kind of, like, to me, having, like, a projection there, but a projection of troops and mm-hmm. they're trying to fight them, but because they technically don't exist in that space, they're failing. And it's also very terrifying when they're trying to fight something they can't fight. Mm-hmm. I like that. I actually quite like yeah. that that revision of what we've of the original film. It still plays homage to it without 
going directly back to that. Mm -hmm. That's a great imagery. terror yeah. tactic, right? Yeah. It would just unnerve oh. a, an opposing force. Yeah, and I like the idea of, of Black Wolf using the propaganda films on his, for his troops to motivate them, not understanding that mm -hmm. they represent the losing side of the war. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Hitler's not going to tell him that. No, exactly. Hitler's brain isn't going to. Oh, that could be like a super moment where like Hitler's brain just like loses it and tells him that, okay, we didn't win. It was terrible. Or something I, like that. I don't I, know. I kind of want to see, I would love to see that happen actually, where there's this bit of knowledge that comes to Black Wolf right near the end of the film where he realizes that he's using something that failed the first time. Mm -hmm. With good reason. Like it didn't, it couldn't sustain itself. No, it's, it's hard to, I mean, it's really hard to sustain hate. Yes. Mm hmm. Yeah, and it's uh, and you know also the idea that war is always destructive and always hurting people, and it's always making things worse, and it's never making things better. And with a certain group of people, if you're motivating them by hatred of another group, mm -hmm. I mean, once you vanquish one group, you really just have to construct another group for them to fight, mm -hmm. which is a completely unsustainable thing to do. It like he would have to actually find another group within his group that is now the bad guy. And it just, it would be self-destructive. Mm -hmm. Well, and it is. I mean, we kind, of, we kind of touched base on it earlier yeah. is he's selling an idea to people, even though they don't meet that idea in the first place. Yeah. So in the end, they would be the ones that would be the next target or the Absolutely. final target at the end. And I think, I think we discussed last time too, where we wanted, I, I kind of want to keep some of the stuff with like the little interstitials with the soldiers. Like he killed Fritz, he killed Fritz. And then the guy kills Fritz <laughs> and still <laughs> yeah. says they killed Fritz. Yeah, you we definitely those moments of lightness. Yeah, those light, those light moments of uh, comedic breath. Yeah, because I think we're leaning more towards a, a PG thirteen R film at this point with brain, with Hitler's brain attached to somebody else's <laughs> head. So, um, uh, so we can go dark, but we definitely yeah. want that lightness. Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but I, I think we're leaning with, towards uh, kooky dark. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just like the original one. It's yeah. like it's a dark movie that deals in a lot of dark subject matter. But ultimately, for something that, you know, has Nazis and all this wackiness, it's a pretty fun movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it was a, I really enjoyed watching it again. I hadn't seen it in, in some time and I had forgotten quite a bit of it, particularly the, the juxtaposition of the two animation styles. Yeah. And the story still holds up. It's actually quite timely right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in more ways than one. So certainly a modern live action version would fit, uh, especially we could even move it up in the timeline, I guess, if we needed to. But I think I'd still stay with the Nazis because I, I think that touching base on our current events might be a little bit too sensitive or too timely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Nazis are such a such a symbol like it's everybody knows who the Nazis are. And, yeah. and I mean, in theory, it's like a, a universal symbol of. Uh, very vicious, uh, very, very almost successful, you know, losing side of a, a huge war. Well, honestly, it's that whole thing where, and I would like this to be part of Wizards, is they're like, God damn it, again? Because that's sometimes the feeling that comes up. We're like, I thought we dealt with this. Well, I think that's a lot of the point of the story of Wizards to begin with is mm -hmm. this lost history and we're doomed to repeat the cycle if we're not paying attention to our own history. And I think Avatar is a good representation of that because he turns a blind eye to what's going on. Even though he knows that Black Wolf is sending people into his, the fairy lands to retrieve this propaganda and the weapons so that he can recreate them and rebuild them. Well, and it also gives a very puts a spotlight on like how you say avatar isn't exactly the greatest good character. Cause it's like part of his privilege is he doesn't have to care that much. He lives thousands of years. Yeah. So none of this affects him. It just affects the people around him. So his disassociation with that, because it doesn't affect him is also very dangerous. Yeah. And I think that's something that we definitely, we want to play off a little bit more maybe, but because the reason I was mentioning that is because we have patrols that are trying to keep these, in, these yes. incursions into the fairylands from occurring. I mean, that's where we meet Weehawk and Peewittle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're a team that, that are supposed to be stopping the harvesting of ancient artifacts from the fairylands. And that's where Necron 99 ends up killing P. Whittle, I think it is. Actually, I know it is. Yeah. Um, uh, it, 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 he's trying to get into the Fairylands to take out the president. 
Yeah. The clown president in the, the clown, clown president. I, and I'm sorry. I liked that. I, I know. That's, <laughs> the, the, it, I mean, it's maybe a little much for a live action, but I found that to be a very interesting telling of sort of what the president really meant to the fairies mm-hmm. is that he is kind of a clown and it's just a mask. I have a feeling that that's sort of what Bakshi was trying to convey with that particular character is, is that the president is, is ineffectual and, and really doesn't represent the people. It could also be a useful disguise just well, to have clown makeup on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's very Hunger Games with the very high-level people having super crazy outfits and looks. I wonder if that's mm-hmm. where it came from. Maybe. Well, it kind of makes me think of um, that pasty white you would think of Victorian England. Where, yes. Yeah, where they'd paint their faces and, and, and with this pancake makeup and it it just felt like an extreme of that although he did kind of look like a mime <laughs> <laughs> yeah he did I, like I said if I were going to cast a president I was like I'm going to cast myself because I want to be that guy <laughs> 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 I want to wear that mask because it was I, there's something about the visual that I found really appealing and I, I think that there that it was like I said earlier representative of, of what that role really meant <laughs> Now I'm just thinking like, oh no, the president's stuck in that visi- in that invisible box. Again. Yes. Oh no. <laughs> and Avatar is the one who actually made the box. This isn't an invisible box, and he's not pretending. He's not miming. Avatar actually did it. Yeah, I think it's interesting that that none of the characters really develop. Like you have no sense, real sense of Weehawk or the princess um, or Princess Eleanor or even Avatar for that matter. No. Um, I mean, the only one who seems to have any development at all is actually Black Wolf. Yes. Mm-hmm. There are some kind of caricatures with no depth. So that that's something that, that we definitely we ha- we have time to explore mm-hmm. because there's a lot of filler in this. Yes, um, very much like Lord of the Rings, where there's a lot of walking, a lot of walking. Yeah, <laughs> things, um, and you, you can use that to tell more story. Yeah, there's a lot of narration cards of rather than show the story, we'll just show you a couple stills of of yeah. that rather than fill out the world. I mean, it, it seems to go hand in hand with the quest is walking with yeah. little people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, and you do you do need that journey, obviously, but yeah. but you can make better use of it. Yeah, and I wouldn't mind like a lot of the narration and backgrounds was used kind of for the story of where these two characters, Avatar and Black Wolf, came from, where they have like that fairy queen who just goes away one day and then gives birth to these two very different children, mm-hmm. and yeah. maybe explore that and that relationship and how that sort of actually created the world. And I had some thoughts about that, like because they, they kind of established that Black Wolf is sort of born inherently evil. Mm-hmm. And I always question that kind of storytelling. Yes. I think that it would be more interesting to have Avatar sort of be so, just so naturally talented at magic. Um, and yeah. Black Wolf's resentment comes to the fact that he has to work so hard at it. Yeah, One well, thing I was wondering with Black Wolf as well is, like, you know, they talk, they mention, like, two or three times in the movie that he killed animals as a young boy. And, uh, you know, just like a little bit pop psychology going on. I wonder if a little mm-hmm. bit his characterization is there's these people who are serial killers who kill animals when they're young. What if that person also had magical powers and was a wizard? Mm-hmm. That's an interesting angle on it for sure. Yeah, just to see that developing sickness because you know they're not born evil per se but we need to see that as a product of the environment or a product of illness i mean you've got avatar who's born human where black wolf is born as a mutation so Mm -hmm. there's resentment there already but to have some inherently psychopathic tendencies as part of his mutation but both of these beings being drawn to these magical powers and uh, i mean they're born at a time when magical creatures are rising and replacing humanity as well and and becoming the leaders of this as they grow or being looked towards I'm, i mean it's almost like a new religion or prophecies happening around these two kids yeah and it could also be too like his rejection like it's sort of, they say he was born evil and it sort of seemed like the society he was born into had just made that decision for him mm-hmm. when he was a baby. So that rejection can really twist a person. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the idea, I like what you just said there, Trish. I, I think the idea that mm-hmm. the fact that he was, he was born different, like, like a, a mutant and look, looked monstrous. They treated them as such. And mm-hmm. I, we can just give, give him all of these things that just really explain the hate and anger that this character has. Not justifying yeah. it but certainly explaining it. 
and and like you say, explaining also kind of Avatar's just his malaise about all of it because it comes so easily to him, as you were saying, yeah. that he doesn't have to try. So like he doesn't care as much. Exactly. I think that that kind of explains sort of how he's not really the good one, but he's because he doesn't care about anything. He just mm-hmm. is right, and he represents the opposite of Black Wolf, even though he's not really better than Black Wolf. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I think that that those gray areas work better than black and white, good and evil. Oh, absolutely. And with live action, you kind of, you need the gray areas, I yeah. think, more. Like, it's, we're not doing a cartoon, so, like, you don't need to, like, super exaggerated. Exactly. And Eleanor, yeah, I, I didn't get a good handle on her either. It's sort of, she's just happy-go-lucky, and, and their her relationship with Avatar is kind of different. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she, no kidding. <laughs> very much yeah. so, right? But yeah, she's she was there for the sake of being there, I, I felt. I, they, they felt mm-hmm. they needed a female character. Well, you know, fantasy, you need a princess. And Wearing next to nothing. Yeah, well, yes. that's a typical Bakshi thing. Let's try to make yeah. her sexy. And it, she doesn't seem to serve a lot of purpose as far as forwarding the story. So we definitely need to do something with her. Yeah. yeah. I well, mean, until she betrays them, there's not much else she's doing. Yeah. Except for being a victim. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I mean, I kind of envision her as more of a warrior princess versus just being sort of eye candy. I mean, and well, I, I mean, if I, she's an, an heir to an empire, she probably already has some political prominence within the court. So she'd serve some sort of purpose. And if her interests lie within the combat and, and military aspects, maybe she was assigned to that by the president, her father. Oh, I like the idea of her knowing that her father is just a figurehead Mm -hmm. and that she aspires to be more than that. She wants to actually represent and be a leader. Yeah, where he's all like pomp and and frills and and just there to be seen as a figurehead. Yeah, she really wants to lead and do something better for her people. Yeah, I like that idea because she was the voice of reason. She's the one who got Avatar motivated in the movie in the first place. Right? Mm-hmm. to go and, and actually address the problem with Black Wolf. Yeah, uh, so I mean, and cool. at the opening of this film, too, these supposed good lands aren't that great, because you see fairies as hookers at the beginning yeah. of the film. So even they're doing what they can to survive in this world. So it's not all happy-go-lucky over there either. So yeah. maybe both societies are failing in some regard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, or they just... Uh, People have a need, and there's people who are happy to provide it, and it's all good. Oldest profession. It's true. True. But the fairy hookers don't look particularly happy to be doing that job. Fair. <laughs> and so if we use the, it, we just have to make them happier. I guess. Yeah, they <laughs> or just need to be liberated. Like, state-sponsored brothels where they're just running their own show. But with it, when it comes to um, Eleanor, I think we can also, like, as you say, more of, she wants to be more of a warrior. And it, we could delve into the whole idea where her father has sent her to Avatar to learn magic and be a full fairy. But Avatar isn't teaching her anything. and it's Because he doesn't a, know how. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's just easy for him, so he doesn't know how to explain it. Yeah. But it would also be a political move for her father, because everybody loves Avatar so much. He's like, oh, no, my daughter's studying with her. It's like saying your kid went to Harvard. It's just, mm-hmm. it makes him look good and doesn't help her in any way. <laughs> yeah, but that also kind of explains her relationship with Avatar, because she's spending time with him. True. And she, I think she has a sense of who he really is deep down, um, and she's trying to bring that person out. And I'd like to see that, at the, see her do more of that, because yes. I think that's what was happening in this movie, but just... Well, they do say she's well. not, like, a full fairy either, so she must be under some sort of tutelage as well. Yeah. And she does have some inherent power of her own. So there's probably a mentorship going on here, and... We, because we've got a weird little love triangle here. We don't yeah. really see the, uh, until later that Eleanor is like, isn't so much into Weehawk as Avatar. She likes the older dudes, but <laughs> yeah, like thousands of years older dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, and they establish that she's not exactly young either i mean she's a couple hundred years older herself yeah yeah these are long-lived species when you measure a few hundred years to a few thousand that's still a big age gap well yeah i mean mean, it it takes the age gap to creepy 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 (laughs) super creepy levels but Mm -hmm. but at the same time she's got experience that a 20 year old wouldn't have with a 50 year old right it makes me wonder like when she's learning to be a full fairy do we want to define what a full fairy is because that 
really threw me because I'm like, she's born a fairy and she has some powers. So what does making her a full fairy do? Maybe it's just yeah, a, that's a question, um, like a, a bat mitzvah kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, you, you're becoming a, this is, you know, you're no longer a child fairy. You're 150 and you're now a full fairy. <laughs> No, you know what? You can make that something that her father's been using doing to manipulate her. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Actually, I kind I kind of like the Bavitsa thing cuz it goes with the Nazi allegory and the Jewish allegory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me wonder what yeah. they're snipping. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they they do uh they have uh like what's a bat mitzvah for for women? It's yeah, yeah. it's a bat mitzvah. Yeah, bat is for the girls and then bar is for the boys. But what was your idea there, Sam? I was just saying that it, that she, it was something her father could be doing to keep her sort of under control. Yeah. Like, well, you're not a full fairy yet. You need you still need to to do more to be a full fairy, even though she's born a full fairy. Well, you know, I, I think maybe it comes down to the level of control over your powers. I think all fairies have it, and she hasn't fully developed it yet. Maybe it's something like that. Is it is we can combine the two ideas of the bat mitzvah, you know, coming into womanhood, along with this this ideal in a fantasy world and mix up the allegory a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And like what they do at bat mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs, like when they're supposed to like kind of do a reading, but instead of a reading, they have to perform like a spell mm. successfully. Yeah. I kind of like that. And I, I've kind of got the feeling that she wasn't really that interested in doing magic. I like to play on that too, is like where she's learned her warrior skills and that's where, yeah. where she's really, really good. But she's just not interested in the magic side and doesn't see how, they can complement each other. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. That's really awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that could be like bringing a, her into like conflict with her father. She has, oh my gosh, if she's dating Avatar, maybe there's this whole father issue thing. Maybe that's it. <laughs> mm-hmm. She's got daddy issues. There we go. <laughs> oh, we did it. <laughs> that's classic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so who do we got figured out here? We got Avatar figured out. We got. Black will really fucked up. <laughs> yeah, but figured yeah. out. But figured out. Eleanor's figured out. Weehawk and Peace Weehawk. we still need to deal with a little bit. Weehawk kind of works as he is, you know, this soldier whose partner's killed during his assignment, who initially is drawn in because of Necron 99 and uh, mm-hmm. failing to stop him. And that's when Peewittle's also killed. Yeah. Yeah. And he's and that, he's trying to race towards the president to to warn him, but he's too late. That's sort of that, that heroic arc of like failing and then redemption. But he never gets that redemption really. No, he he does feel like he's the Luke Skywalker of the group or whatever, where he's gonna grow and get the princess, and maybe he does get more competent. He does have to make up for his failures. And he is a dedicated soldier, and you think he is going to get the princess at the end. You know, hero gets the girl, but he's not really the hero of the story. It's Avatar. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I would like. The, I actually, I just had a thought, and then this popped in my head just now. Is um, because he doesn't really come to fruition in the original. What if he shows up at that last battle scene and is the one who helps them break that barrier? There, yeah, he leads. Sort of, he's he's sort of the the heroic leader of the battle. I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah, because now his assignment was to destroy the projector. Well, we've kind of taken care of the projector and <laughs> with, yeah. with a brain hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> I love the brain hat. <laughs> it's so, so disturbing. Yeah. I can just yeah. picture no. it, though. It's, yeah. it's not leaving my head, guys. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I love the idea of, of Weehawk showing up at the battle going, they're not real. Just keep hitting them until you find the real ones. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right? And being that leader. Um, yeah. If you if they don't go down, then keep going. Yeah. 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 I, and I, I think that that would give sort of give his, his story a, sort of an ending. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you know what you could also do is like it could be also his knowledge that saves him as well. Because, I mean, the ones dressed in Nazi uniforms – are the projections and he knows what the other guys look like. So he could be like, no, no, those aren't real, but those guys are. Exactly. Something along those lines, just to, to sort of make him, make him a hero in his own right, which is what he deserves mm-hmm. um, is, is part of his arc is that failure. And then his search for who he really is 
Yeah. Right. And that conflict with peace, peace Necron 99, because he, there's, he has an animosity towards this, this construct because yeah. it's, it killed his friend um, and his president. And there's that moment in the film where peace rescues him and, and they, they sort of, uh-huh. the switch flips and it's like, okay, this isn't the same creature that killed my friend. Yeah. Right. So, so, and I think we, ha- we, we do want to have that. So, I th- and I think that that's where we talk sort of starts yeah. to grow is, is at that point. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's too like he might be just like a frustrated soldier. He's like, but I'm just like a foot soldier. So it's kind of where he's learning like, no, you're not born to be only one thing. There's no like ultimate destiny of what you have to be. And that's what peace sort of represents to him. I like that a lot. I think that works really well because, yeah, because we do have sort of that transition from foot soldier to leader. Um, yeah. And yeah, you, there's there's going to be a tipping point there, and I think that's a really good spot for exactly. it. Exactly. And then mm. Peace's sacrifice really kind of makes more sense as well, because that's Absolutely, yeah. something Peace wouldn't actually do as Necron ninety nine. Yay! No, I'm like like in all of that. <laughs> well, and if we do like this Golem with Necron ninety nine as he comes Peace, we could change because we've the way I describe him, he's kind of this uh, fucked up version of an SS costume. And Mm -hmm. we can see him change as well, like physically, like yanking off the symbology and Mm -hmm. as well and showing that change physically and uh, not wanting to look like this incarnation of evil. No, I like that. I I think that, again, it's a great way to visually show his transition, even though he's not entirely sentient, there's still that, that suggestion of it. Yeah. Even before they go on the quest, I, I'd love like maybe some child within the the community of the kingdom coming up to him and maybe like painting a smiley face on on this blank face, nice or something, just to say, okay, not everybody fears him, and if this small child can see that he already is a different person, then maybe peace can see it too. Oh, you know what? You, I love that. I do love that, Jay. Mm-hmm. And I love the idea of as part of that sort of growing, mm-hmm. it becomes a mouth. Like it actually becomes a mouth. Because I, I think the first time we talked about this, you mentioned the fact that you'd, you'd prefer he didn't speak at all yeah. until the end, right? And that's why. is because he finally gets his mouth. Ah, so yes. He, oh, that's awesome. Yes. Yes, because I still like that. Like, let's make when he does speak really poignant until he has to. So a lot of it's just pointing and and through action. But when he speaks, it's it needs to say something. It needs to mean something. I like the line he has. I just wanted at the very end where he says, "No more pain." Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, he's ultimately still probably not going to survive this, but to die heroically after doing some fairly monstrous things at the beginning. I, yeah. I think that's a really good arc. Yeah, I think it really is. And I and I just love that whole idea of, of the fact that he's been in pain the whole time, right up until the point of his death. Oh, yeah. And you have no idea until he actually can speak. Mm-hmm. That actually might bring a tear to somebody's eye. Yeah. <laughs> I feel sad about, like, I feel right now, it's just like, oh, <laughs> that poor guy. I have no mouth, but I must scream. Yes. Harlan oh. Ellison. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I think that that could work really well for that character now. Wow, it's already hit Trish in the feel, so I think yeah, we hit something there. <laughs> um, really I think that kind of rounds out the characters we need to really focus on, and I think we got a good structure here. Let's get into some recasting. We'll do this a little differently. And guess what? We just did something completely different than what we did last time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We didn't yes, rehash we did. our old ideas, guys. So whatever went wow. out into the ether obviously wasn't meant to be we had time travel in that one yeah you did (laughs) it wasn't meant to be yet maybe our ideas were too good and yeah uh, you know the universe was like no 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 we're not ready to hold on to that one yeah (laughs) you guys are not ready for that one yeah Yeah, there are a few simple ideas that kind of made it into this one but on the whole yeah it's a a very different envisioning of the absolutely i think the last time we actually hashed out a really really interesting semi-prequel slash continuation yeah, this time. But there's one request I definitely want in this one that I, I, I had from last time is at the point where they're on the mountain and they're walking in the snow. Mm-hmm. Oh, wear shoes? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> like, why is the Tauntaun got socks, but Avatar and uh, Eleanor well, do not? <laughs> Eleanor's like freezing. He puts a poncho on her, but her feet are still exposed. 
Yeah, that they sh- help. all their toes should have fallen off by the time they got wherever they were going. <laughs> Absolutely, magic bitches. <laughs> the magic gave her a poncho. The magic can give her boots. Yes, <laughs> or something on their feet to keep, help keep them warm. Yes, yeah. please. <laughs> she got fucking wings. She doesn't even need to be in the snow at all. <laughs> True. <laughs> like, let's be realistic here. She could have flown the whole way and yeah. probably gone back and forth a few times going, what's holding you up, Avatar? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> why Why are the magic or people? Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, it's Lord of the Rings. It, it, well, it, yeah, maybe maybe these wings Where, are just for show. <laughs> well, Lord of the Rings where Legolas just walks on the snow because he's so light. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but he wore boots. He did yeah, have yeah. boots. Even the soles of his feet are going to get cold. Yeah. Maybe we needed an extra hour exposition at the beginning talking about how their their feet are actually extra thick. And <laughs> uh, it's like wearing shoes. <laughs> it's Hobbit-like. <laughs> yeah, maybe the film sponsor will be Dr. Scholes or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to mix it up today. I'll go first, and then we'll move on here. So for my narrator, I went with Alice Krieg. I wanted somebody with a similar but interesting voice quality to her, and I always liked her as the Borg Queen, and uh, she's got a really interesting voice. Check out our Ghost Story episode, too. Mm -hmm. So I think she would be a great narrator for this, a very similar narrator in many respects. For Eleanor, I went with Crystal Reed from Swamp Thing. I was kind of casting with their visual looks in mind as well. So I kind of wanted to bring out some of the Bakshi designs in these characters as real people. Now, Avatar, I kind of envisioned as somebody whose body is actually changed with his apathy. He's a heavy smoker. He's a drinker. He's got a gruff voice and he's, he's short. And I don't Mm -hmm. think he's always been that way. So I think over time, as his apathies and not caring, it's changed him physically. And um, maybe when he rediscovers himself, we can see that physical change. So it could require more than one actor. But um, for most of the film, I want it to be Danny DeVito. <laughs> yeah, uh, he was on my list. I Actually, he was my original avatar, but I, I actually found somebody different because I had something else in mind for that. And I'll explain it when I get to mine. Nice. For Weehawk, I went with Jackson Rathbone. He uh, was in the Twilight movies. He played Jasper. Handsome, but uh, kind of has a similar look as well. For Black Wolf, I wanted somebody to show the age but have gravitas in their voice and a deep voice. So I went with uh, Stephen McCaddy, Canadian treasure Stephen mm-hmm. McCaddy. Uh, I've, I've talked about him a few times, so go check out his stuff. Hey, why not? For uh, Necron slash Peace, if he's going to have a one really important line, uh, I want it to be done by a very good voice actor who was also in this uh, original film, Mark Hamill. Why not? Why not? Why not? You know what? I'm not sure who to... I didn't have a director in mind for this one. This one's a, a kind of a weird one where I couldn't put my thumb on who would be really well suited for this one. Yeah, I don't know. I might chime in as I think about it here because uh, I it, it struggled on it, and I clearly, even after an extra week, <laughs> I still don't have one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's move on to uh, Jeff, and uh, maybe maybe it'll spark something in my mind for a director. Well, you know, I uh, actually. I'm glad that we didn't do last week's episode because I'm much happier with the director I was thinking of this morning where I think that ultimately it would be really, really cool if this was directed by Robert Rodriguez and Ralph Bakshi. Nice. Similarly to how they did Sin City where it's like Ralph, you know, Robert Rodriguez is uh, this director who has lots of experience with big effects movies and weird movies and Mm -hmm. low budget movies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he's obviously a fan of working with, you know, luminaries and people who are not like just having a director background. And so it'd be kind of interesting to see what they might be able to come up with in terms of, you know, whether it's like a CG motion capture thing or if it's like a live action animation hybrid type thing or however that might manifest itself. I think Mm. that would be a cool combination. I think for casting, I was thinking for Black Wolf, Willem Dafoe, (laughs) just because I love Willem Dafoe and I want him to be the villain in a lot of stuff. And uh, he, you know, obviously does movies in the full range of budget so it's not really as much of a concern uh, because it's uh, rob rodriguez i was thinking for it'd be fun if avatar was jeff fahey <laughs> he would find uh, somewhere for all the time yeah 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 and uh, he has a really good kind of 
like I'm a little bit tired and gruff. <laughs> I kind of want to get on with this kind of uh, tonality in his voice and a lot of characters he plays, which I think would match Avatar in a fun way. I think for Eleanor, I was actually thinking maybe Rosa Salazar, who is in Alita Battle Angel, because, you know, she's uh, been acting for a little while, but she uh, can do kind of, if we're going to go a warrior princess route, she can do kind of the more mm-hmm. uh, stunty type stuff as evidenced in the last movie. And I think she was also in a Maze Runner movie and she has a good look for it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. I think uh, for Weehawk, I was actually thinking Ross Lynch, who was in My Friend Dahmer and also in The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina on Netflix as Harvey. Wow. Uh, he's a cool actor. I just kind of think that he would be good in terms of he kind of has this quality of like innocence, but also of, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, kind of everything we talked about Weehawk, I think Ross Lynch could fit that kind of role. Nice. I was thinking for peace, actually, it'd be fun if he was played by Dan Stevens, who uh, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I haven't seen Downton Abbey, but he's an apostle and he was also in The Guest and he was also a audiobook narrator. He read a really good adaptation of Frankenstein. Apostle and, was really uh, good. I covered that one in 31 Days of Horror. Yeah, Apostle is, is great, nice. yeah. and he has a great voice, and I think he's also a fan of kind of doing interesting kind of projects and playing around with, like, his image because he's in Downton Abbey and doing things that's not expected. So doing a movie where mm-hmm. he's not even seen and he only has one line, but he's an actor in it, I think, would weirdly appeal to him. Cool. <laughs> I was actually thinking for the narrator, just because she did a really good job with Inherent Vice, uh, Joanna Newsom. Nice. Because she kind of had, uh, in the movie, she was like a fortune teller who was narrating the movie. But she has this really, really awesome kind of smoky quality to her voice that is kind of, would lend itself well to this kind of, you know, maybe a little bit lowbrow kind of, you know, 70s flair fantasy movie. And for the little interstitials for the soldiers, I was thinking it'd be awesome to cast Key and Peele. Jordan Peele and uh, Keegan <laughs> Michael Key. Nice. <laughs> I, I also that. cast those guys. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's good. I like that a lot. <laughs> that's so good. And yeah, that's uh, that's what I got for Wizards. <laughs> for all of them, you need uh, every time, even though it's going to be different characters, it still needs to be Key and Peele for every single one because they'll be in costume, right? Yeah. So oh yeah. It'll, it'll be awesome to have. Yeah, it plays, plays with the yeah plays with the joke with Ralph Bakshi doing most of those voices. So yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I want them to write some of this stuff like mm-hmm. i want them to be also improving if they can because they're yeah, they're they like be- really kings of yelling at each other and just interacting with each other in ridiculous ways yes okay well uh, let's move on to trish since she's got some similar casting here i do okay so i started with the narrator and for the narrator i chose kathleen turner because i like that kind of whiskey soaked voice it makes me very happy yeah yeah and yeah it's good and it's getting even better as she ages Yes. Yes. And I think there's like, just, it would be nice for her to do, like, she's done voiceover work before. Like she was, uh, Jessica Rabbit. So she knows how to do it. She knows what she's doing to create that character. And then for Avatar, I went with Keith David because I like him. He's world weary and he's older. And I think he could tread that line between being likable, but like apathetic. And you're like, why are you so apathetic? But he's still very likable. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that voice. He's got a great voice. And then for Black Wolf, I have another great voice, which is Mark Hamill. That was me too. I went yeah. With Mark Hamill. He's, he's got a great voice. And plus, I think I would like, I think he'd like to do some evil for a bit, like just a nice evil voice, a nice evil character. And oh, yeah. Because, you know, he, he didn't do that with the Joker. <laughs> no, I know. He didn't do that. No, but like, I mean, live action. Nice evil character. Yeah. yeah. And uh, plus, I, and now that he has got a brain on his head, I love it even more. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I was just seeing like, like Haggard Luke at the end of Force Awakens. Just yes. amplify that by like tenfold and you have Black Wolf. What if, oh, what if Hitler's yeah. brain is actually talking to him? So we actually could use a voice of Hitler here. Ooh. Yeah. If I did do that, I'd like a Toby Jones from Winter Soldier type of deal. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, For yeah. me, I would love uh, Bill Hader. <laughs> Bill Hader. Okay. Yeah. yeah, as the voice of robot Hitler brain, he'd do a great job. Well, didn't <laughs> Sam Rockwell do like a German in, in Jojo Rabbit? Who was I it? Seen it? I haven't seen it. Yeah, I haven't seen oh, it. Oh, that was uh, um, Taika Watiti played Hitler in that one. That oh, would also did. be good. 
Yeah, you get somebody who played Hitler as the voice of Hitler. Okay, yeah, Taika Waititi. Awesome. That would totally work. For Eleanor, I went with Jordana Lajoie, who is uh, Frenchie's girlfriend in The Boys. And I just thought she was so cool. And as a warrior, I think she, she would totally rock that one. I um, agree. Yes. And for Weehawk, I wasn't sure how much would be like live action for him. But I like the voice of the person I chose. I wanted Christian Slater, like somebody who's a little bit kind of frustrated in his position, because I, I think he could really portray that. And then Peace, I went with Lee Pace, who is uh, Ronan the Accuser in Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes, I like Lee so Pace. He's good physically. The president, Bobcat Goldthwait. He's, That's genius. He's a perfect president. You know what? Can we just make him the actual president? Because that would be awesome. Uh, <laughs> he could do better. And uh, A we monkey have, could do better. Oh, true. True. A monkey with brain damage could do better. And then there was, a, this was from last week. And I don't know if he's going to run into like that other general, that other elf general that they fall out with. But I had John Cho cast as that. And then for the two soldiers, I had Danny Putty and Donald Glover, who are Troy and Abed on Community. And they have a like kind of a weird, really, really fun dynamic that's just hilarious. And they kind of do interstitials in Community anyway. So I think that would totally work. And I also cast the Fairy Queen because I thought when we were kind of establishing their relationship and their beginning and their growing up, um, I cast Kate Blanchett because she can she can do an awesome like elf or fairy or magical creature. We've and established yeah, she does that. Or she yes. does it great. And then for my director, I went with Karen Kusama, who did uh, Eon Flux, and I think that might work for what we're trying to do here too. As long as the studio doesn't interfere. Absolutely. And that's me. Very cool. That's some good casting there. All right, Sam, take us home. Okay. So I will start with my avatar. Um, so I was thinking that because of the evil in Black Wolf, Avatar is going to look a little bit younger than, than Black Wolf. So I actually went with Zach Galifianakis as Avatar because mm -hmm. I think that he actually almost looks like the way you would see Avatar in, in real life. He's he's um, he's rocking a wizard look already. Yeah, he kind of <laughs> exactly. is. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he does that sort of, like Trish said, that ap that apathy quite well. And a little bit of weirdness between two ferns is just, it doesn't get <laughs> weird than that. Um, I can't even really watch it because it's just too weird even for me. <laughs> yeah. As we've established, I went with Mark Hamill for Black Wolf as well. Yes. Uh, for my Weehawk, I went, um, again, I was, because I was thinking warriors, I went with people who are capable of, of doing like physical action and, and mm -hmm. possibly even martial arts. So I went with Aramis Knight. He was a young warrior in the Into the Badlands TV series. So he does the martial arts. And like much like Jay, I was thinking that to keep, sort of keep the fairy look with the actors, with the high cheekbones and the, and the, the, sh the sharper features, just to, to minimize the need for too much makeup or special effects. Mm. Um, so, and he has that look. He's got really striking, sharp features. And then keeping that in mind, for Eleanor, I went with Zazie Beats yes. again, because I know she can do action. And I just, I love her look. I, I think she's just really ethereal almost. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that uh, worked really well as Eleanor, especially as a warrior princess. For Peace, Necron 99, um, because I was thinking it was more of a physical role. I did go with Ray Park. I know that he has had some recent controversy, but I didn't know it at the time. So And then I kept my original casting, mm -hmm. so... And I, I think that he could deliver the line if uh, at the end as well. Yeah, I think it's uh, a case of, uh, well, he's not very good at line delivery, but he's good at the physical. And But he's getting a little older. I think an, any really great stuntman would be great in that part. It's it's kind of like Jason. You need somebody with a physical presence, and, and you can have a voice do the line. Yeah. But it doesn't really matter either way. Yeah, but I definitely definitely wanted somebody who could do. Again, I'm, I was thinking this movie would be a lot more have a lot more physical visual action uh -huh. in a, in a live action remake because you because it's it lends itself to that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you um, definitely want to up those action sequences for sure. Yeah. And then one thing we didn't talk about in our in our remake was one of the side characters that I really enjoyed and I I think actually could be used better used was was Frog the yeah. uh, Black Wolf's sort of servant monster thing. Um, so I did cast that because I wanted Hank Azaria to do the voice of that particular mm -hmm. creature. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, he does... He, I think that he, you need that sort of levity in those Black Wolf scenes once in a while, especially if, considering the direction that we've gone with him. I, I like the idea of Frog talking to the Hitler brain instead of to, directly to Black Wolf, almost. <laughs> can, can we have Hank Azaria reprise his voice from um, the Robin Williams and Nathan Lane Birdcage movie? Yes, if we want to. <laughs> I also cast the the um, mother to be. I called her the fairy princess. Yeah, I don't I don't know what her actual name was in the movie. I couldn't find mm -hmm. it, but um, but I saw that character because at the end of the original, she had sort of a, po a powerful moment that between Weehawk and and Eleanor, where he's 
raging at her because she betrayed them. And mm-hmm. she talks about how there's been enough fighting. I wanted to see that character a little bit more and develop a little bit more. So I cast Elle Fanning because she also mm-hmm. meets that sort of that ideal. She's tall and blonde. So I could see that being sort of fitting into what Black Wolf was trying to do with his human child. So yeah, I wanted to build on that character a little bit more as well. I did cast a narrator on the fly last time we recorded this, um, but I'm sticking with her because I think she'd be fantastic. I went with Dame Judy Dench. Yes. Yeah, I think that she'd be a fantastic narrator for this. Cool. And, and then my last thing is the director. And again, I was kind of thinking about who could do sort of a little bit of horror a little bit of action and a little bit of comedy. And there's one name that always ticks all those boxes and that's Sam Raimi. Actually. Yeah. I think he might be perfect for this. Yeah. Um, I would watch that movie for sure. So, exactly. yeah. so that's where I'm at. All right. Well, I think that's some great casting all around and I'm on board for Sam Raimi as director since I didn't have one <laughs> in mind. But it's Sam Raimi, um, should we make Bruce Campbell the president? Oh yes. Yes, yes we should. <laughs> and because it's Sam Raimi, where, who would Ted Raimi play? Uh, P. Whittle. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or a John. <laughs> or Frog, actually. Oh. Yeah, he could do Frog instead of Hank Azaria, for sure. He could mm-hmm. be Frog. I, I would just like to see him trying to pick up a fairy hooker. <laughs> as Frog. Yeah, as Frog. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> too funny <laughs> yeah, the frog doesn't need to be a frog because he was kind no. of a lizard actually yeah, he's more movie. of a lizard thing but well, he was as you're frog, talking like uh, ray park kind of in the li- way of like toad in x-men mm. humanoid but like amphibious yeah he he don't look like that anymore guys he's 50 <laughs> yeah. no no but i mean like the the makeup for that yeah yeah that could work well for a frog where he's 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 humanoid but has Mutated. Now I still mm-hmm. like him being a, a kind of a special effects yeah. kind yeah. of creature thing. Yeah, that's where that's where I was going with him initially because we want some of those really absurd mutations. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I think so too. Yeah, no, I think I think we've come up with something uh, kind of fun. This is one that nice studio I think would have, be taking a heavy risk on <laughs> as a live action. I mean, it's yeah. it's not going to be cheap, and it's going to be uh, a little weird, a little absurd, and whether people will be able to buy it or not, I don't know. But I like it. I'd go see it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm loving what we've come up with. I, I, and this is one of those ones where I'm like, at the end, I'm going, you know what? I want to see this now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's partially why I wanted to cast uh, or wanted to have Robert Rodriguez as director as well is because you know he's a person where a lot of his movies are really 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 risky but he just finds yeah. the money somehow and it's like that's that's basically who you if you're going to do this as a live action movie it would have to be basically self-funded by someone <laughs> well, yeah the section of Grindhouse was like my favorite section I think it works better after all this time and it is so absurd and so wild and so crazy (laughs) well i'm kind of wondering who the rights are with this because i mean these feel like they're independent but they were released through fox Mm -hmm. who bought fox disney would disney make this kind of movie fuck no (laughs) hell no and they definitely would not cash ray park they actually just announced that that he will not be reprising darth maul man you Uh, know i was looking that up and uh, it's seemingly just a, amounted to accidentally uploaded something instead of something else and then deleted it and was embarrassed and, and people turned it into a big weird thing. Yeah, yeah. that's what I read too. Yeah, um, that's, that's what was my interpretation of it as well. And this just goes to show you this cancel culture is getting a little out of fucking hand. Well, but. you know what? You can get it. But here's the thing. I've heard that argument as well. It's like, oh, it was an accident. And that's the apology and it's but sometimes his it's wife not backs him up on it and oh okay she was, well then yeah. that's perfect yeah, yeah. oh yeah. but I, it brought me to the one thing we're discussing last time when it like comes to porn and i figured out my thing like i don't understand why people hack other people's porn i, I look at it like like theater and sports i kind of just want to see professionals do it <laughs> I, i'm not interested in amateurs <laughs> <laughs> when's the last time you saw a good amateur sex tape never <laughs> no they don't understand don't writing or camera angles yeah no right? you just want some cinema yeah <laughs> you're, you're i want there, a proper for the, crew. Like, normal people don't do impossible positions that are good for a camera angle <laughs> right you know i i do not no. watch a porn if they cannot answer me one question who is your cinematographer <laughs> right <laughs> oh boy that's Who, ridiculous. who's doing the body makeup <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I want it done properly. Yeah, who I'm provided craft it. services that day? 
<laughs> was a Bob or Barbie doing the fluffing? <laughs> exactly. Credit where credits do. <laughs> right? Did it have credits? <laughs> Does anybody ever get to the credits? <laughs> Let's be honest. That's why they put them at the beginning. <laughs> yes. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right, well, this was our 250th episode. I can't believe it's been this long now, 250 episodes, and we're only a few weeks away from our fifth anniversary as well. Five years. We're getting into, like, Marin territory here with, uh, mm -hmm. oh, I'd like to say a quarter of the audience, but that means we were really doing well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm working up, I want to work up to that. <laughs> yes. But uh, you can do that. By telling your friends and family, your pet, your enemy across the street, tell them all about Invasion of the Remake. Help them get more earballs on the show. Uh, you can also follow us on our social media at Invasion Remake on Twitter, Invasion of the Remake on Facebook and Instagram, and Invasion of the Remake at gmail.com if you want to email us your suggestions, your corrections, your comments, or you just want to chat with us at any of those places. We're cool. We're down for that as well. Man, you guys have been like pouring in the fan challenges as of late this is great <laughs> i'm actually starting to get a queue up for a little bit so it could be a while before we get to some some of the suggestions but uh don't worry we haven't forgotten about you and uh all credit where credit's due when we get there we will uh, let you know when that episode drops if we choose to do that episode but it's great to see you interacting with us. We want to see more of that. That's great. Clearly, you're all bored during the COVID lockdown, but I'm mm -hmm. happy we're here for you because it's. it feels like the first four years were fairly quiet as far as interaction. Mm -hmm. And this year, it's really nice to be talking to y'all. Yeah. Well, it people really were is. busy and had things to do before. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, was, I don't have time for those fucking podcasters. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> <laughs> or it's more like, that was good. I should write them a letter someday. Yeah. yeah. And the someday mm -hmm. finally arrived. Yeah, because yeah. they were all some days now. <laughs> yes. Every day is a someday. <laughs> Remember when we were out living our lives? Well, I mean, I'm I'm uh, just living my life now. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be honest, not much has changed for me. Uh. Yeah. Actually, I uh, absurdly in some ways uh, some of the some of the changes have been very positive for me. Just uh, you know, just from a uh, from some standpoints, but Okay. I think the biggest thing I've noticed is staying in that routine for personal hygiene because it's really easy to let that slide if you're not careful. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've got friends who've got like the big COVID beard and I kind of look at them and like, well, razors didn't stop working. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I got a, I get a little lazy. There's a little extra day in there where I don't shave, but I'm like, I'm still yeah. showering and every day I can't do the covid beer drive me fucking nuts <laughs> and the haircuts are a lot further apart which is scary with my hair how thick it gets but it's, but that's some of the stuff that is affected uh, of our lives is it's harder to yeah. get those bookings and and even wanting to when when it's mm -hmm. your, your city's opened up to doing so um they've already cut your own hair too yeah well and that's just it scissors still work too so not a big deal <laughs> Yeah, but I've been there's... cutting my own hair for like three, four years now. Oh wow! Oh yeah, no, I'd, I've never done that. But <laughs> if I had a proper shaver, I would just probably do that. <laughs> I have trouble doing my own hair. I can't imagine trying to cut it. There's it's the first there's some few times were rough. <laughs> I did suffer some dark moments where I considered giving myself bangs. Yikes! <laughs> yeah. I've seen those YouTube videos. Don't do it, Trish. I know, right? Why are you watching those YouTube videos? <laughs> I don't go searching for them, but they show up on my Facebook feed occasionally. I do watch them because they're funny. Yeah. Yeah, they're like they're on they're like those fail compilations and I, I find them hugely entertaining as long as nobody gets hurt. Yes. Right. Yeah. Failing at bangs is nobody gets hurt, just emotionally. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh you know what'll make you happier? Buying some what? sweet, sweet invasion merch. <gasps> yes. Yeah, RT Public Store is open 
and just search it out uh, invasion of the remake on t public and we've got lots of cool designs up there and as we think uh-huh. of more and more will be coming up if we've we're slowly accumulating some stuff in the queue so we can do another wave of things uh mm-hmm. so we got some exciting ideas for you but we just released our podcast forever masks we got three variants uh-huh. in in two different styles so there's like six versions of those and a lot of other designs you can get as uh, ppe masks as well and you can now be that person you saw in that thing that one time by wearing mm-hmm. the shirt. You can also somebody out there's getting one. I know that for sure. That's right. I'm getting and one. <laughs> you can you've survived thirty one days of horror with us for several years now. Now you can say I have survived thirty one days of horror. If you do the yep. thirty one days of horror challenge with us, watching that horror movie a day every day in October and get to the end, you deserve that shirt. You do. Yeah. And we've got three different designs on I Survived 31 Days of Horror. So uh-huh. grab one. Uh, actually, it's worth bragging about. Five, five, six actually, because we have the, the front design and we also have the back design with the logo on the front. So That's there's right. six options in total for those ones. And I just want to say something really quickly is we give this content for free every single week. And this is a great way to support the podcast and still get something in return. You still get a shirt. So it's... We're not asking you to just hand money out, but certainly if you are interested in giving us a little bit of support, go ahead, buy the shirts. You get you get some cool merchandise, and you can help us out too. And the masks are really useful. Yes. Yeah. If you don't have a mask, you know, first of all, what? Get a mask. Uh, you know, perfect. We have a place for you. Uh-huh. <laughs> Absolutely. Save lives by wearing a mask. And you can look cool doing it by buying one of ours. Yes. Yeah, because our podcast for everyone's really slick. It's uh, it's basically a skull with a microphone in front of it. So if you're a podcast fan or a podcaster yourself, it is kind of a must. But uh, you can even just rock the Invasion logo on a mask. I'm doing that right now. So Well, not yeah. this very second, but that's the one I regularly rock right now. During this time period. During this you know, time period. If there's any merch that you would love to see where you thought, man, if only they had something kind of like this, I would for sure buy it. Well, let us know. You know, we're pretty crafty. We could figure it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can't, it's not just uh, t shirts and masks over at T Public. You can get our designs on a pillow, uh, a print for your wall, uh, mugs, and stickers. Stickers. And there's a lot. It's not just t shirts either. They're tank tops and long sleeves and hoodies. So Mm -hmm. lots of cool ways to show your support for Invasion of the Remake and look awesome doing it. And personally, the Tee Public, they've got some really great quality shirts. I got like the extra soft ones and they're fantastic. Yeah, I just wore mine for the first time this week and it was very comfortable. So I was uh, pretty happy Mm -hmm. with the shirt and uh, they've got all sorts of designs and weaves and stuff. So that uh, you can find the best one for you. Mm Mm-hmm. Cool, and uh, make sure uh, you uh, check out our Wix site. That's got uh, kind of our hub if uh, you're just being introduced to it, and you can see all the places we aggregate and find the provider that best suits you. Sam, what is the uh, home base for that Wix site? It is invasionoftheremake.wixsite.com slash podcast. And you can find links to uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Tune in, Spotify, and we're on a ton of different places as well. If none of those fit the bill, I'm sure you can find us on your favorite provider. We are uh, now on Ghana over in India if uh, for our foreign listeners. Uh, they're one of the biggest providers over there. And uh, we're going to be on Amazon Music and Audible once they get their podcast portal up and live. So watch for that in the near future. We're everywhere. You can't stop the invasion, especially for the remakes. You, you kind of want to, but... <laughs> <laughs> they're they're never going to stop. They're never going to stop. We I just uh, posted some news about another remake that's in the works. So watch our uh, social media feeds for some of those as well, because we sometimes yeah. will post news about new remakes coming as well. And that yeah. that will probably inform you of an episode that might come down the road <laughs> as well. The remakes uh, just keep coming. Inevitably, we will cover it. All right. Well, this has been episode 250 unbelievable 250 episodes i've been jason i'm always sam i continue to be trish and i am jeff omega and we are out of here
the projector destroyed, the battle was over. Shadow creatures froze in their tracks. Some faded. Some crawled back to hell. Mutants, leaderless, ran. Elves swept the beaches clear of the few remaining mutants that still fought. Hundreds of circling blackbirds screamed at the carnage below. There was some rejoicing. But mostly, everyone wished to return home quickly to tell their loved ones that the war was won. Hitler was dead again. And that they could live once more in peace in a land they love so much. God-given. Amen. <laughs>